Taco Bell the movie. Is it a done deal? Is the script in the can? We'll find out today on the Cinema Nine podcast. Michael Govier, Travis Roy, and Eric Bransham, three people who enjoy talking film. We're going to talk about today. Look at this. Behind me, if you're watching, woo! The steamy back of Michael Douglas in 1992. <laughs> oh man, he was in his prime, looking good steamy. back in the day, pre -th pre throat cancer. Good for him. <laughs> We're gonna talk about Basic Instinct. Does it hold up or not? Eric Selection from 1992, still in a room without a view, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. We'll do that, you know, probably about 35 minutes in. That's usually how things go. Of course, we'll do our quarantine viewing picks and. And we'll say hello to Travis and Eric. Travis, I know you're not feeling as great as you'd like to feel, but you got a dog to comfort you, to get you through the hard times. It is Mara's one-year birthday today. Oh. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> I just think I was uh, celebrating that, but uh, <laughs> Eric's daughter had a birthday, nope. too. Yay! <laughs> I figured you'd get to him. <laughs> Her second birthday. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm 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 doing uh, okay. I sound terrible because I've been screen puking for a while, um, but I'm doing better now. Um, it's been a very ill season for the Cinema Nine. Oh Jesus! All three of us it. just uh, you were COVID last week, uh, Eric. You were sick for like a month straight before <laughs> two, that. Two months, two months. Yeah. The other day, I was like, literally, I said to myself out loud, "Holy shit, I, I I'm not sick." And I have been really great. <laughs> I haven't been uh, like like stomach sick like vomiting sick since i mean like literally years and now it's twice in like five weeks Ew. bad time but i'm glad to be here on the cinema nine podcast talking about the psychosexual basic instinct Ooh, yeah. Everybody uh, get your openly, boners out get, no don't get your boners out <laughs> email <laughs> the show i mean no don't send us any pics though no <laughs> don't open any attachments mike Okay, yeah, uh, no attachments for the next hour and a half. Hey, Travis, are you going to puke during the show? Uh, I don't think so. I'll, I will run away and definitely mute things if that happens. No, I've, I haven't thrown up in a while. Um, it just sounds like I've been gargling Tom Waits in here. Uh, but, uh, 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 spit me out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 you sound like Arnold. Another uh, Paul Verhoeven movie, Total Recall. Uh, 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 movie. <laughs> Dang, you're right. Oh, boy. So uh, we're glad to have you guys aboard. Make sure you cinema nine pot at gmail.com if you want to talk to us about anything. Five-star review. Subscribe and like our videos and our YouTube channel. Everything you can do to support the show, just connect with us. We'll connect right back at you. We'll Maybe we'll do a listener's choice down the trail here. We're going to have some guests coming up. We like to throw those guests in, but we're just cranking out the shows week after week. We love movies. This is a mm -hmm. unusual Show time for us, by the way. It's Saturday morning. Once in a blue moon. I can't. Can you actually remember the movie we did? Because I do remember us doing a Saturday morning show a couple years ago, but I don't remember the movie. I think it's only been one time, and I don't remember what it was. It was one time. I almost want to say it was the time we did it with the Cage Rage guy in the morning. That's what I was going to say too. I think it was. I think. Oh, well, then. Was, yeah. yeah. That okay. Well, if two, if a Travis and a Mike agree, they can't be wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, either way, we love having you here, guys. And what we're starting to do in the new year, it's our little fun thing. It's our movie minute tidbits. That's right. Everybody brings one thing to the table that has interested them in recent time or with like literally this morning or maybe three days ago yep. in the world of film and television and entertainment overall, I suppose. There's really we didn't really put a, a governor on it, did we? I, I don't know. No, just news, you know, whatever. News hey, news. all right, Travis, what you got? Give us a tidbit. It's no news, really, that John Carpenter is like a, a, a curmudgeonly old fella. And it's no news that Chevy Chase is a highly hated individual in Hollywood. Uh, but I just love <gasps> it was so funny, this uh, interview that he did recently, uh, John Carpenter with Variety. And he, he could have been talking about either Sam Neill, who he did another movie with the following year. And uh, had a like a long has had a long friendship with since, or he could have been talking about Chevy Chase, which is my suspicion. He said it wasn't pleasant at all. Mm -hmm. It was a horror show. I really wanted to quit the business after that movie. God, I don't want to talk about why, but let's just say there were personalities on that film. He shall not be named who needs to be killed. <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> terrible. He needs to be set on fire. No, oh, no, wow. no. Anyway, it's all fine. I survived it. 
So uh, that is John Carpenter calling for the public execution of, I believe, Chevy Chase, which I yeah. thought was news. Yeah, yeah. all signs are pointing to that for sure. <laughs> Jeez, oh, Pete's. That's my tidbit. And, so just to clarify there, when was this? What movie was this? This was, oh, this was the film. I didn't specify. Sorry. Uh, this was from when they did uh, Memoirs of an Invisible Man together. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that make makes more sense. So. Yeah. Didn't, uh, do we like that movie? I keep I trying to like it. I keep I want to we, like it, but. We love Carpenter around here, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 I even like Chevy Chase. I mean, as yeah. a performer. Yeah. Like, I don't want to hang out with him or be on a long car ride with him, but, um, I, you know, but the movie's just not great, which I hear is a lot to do with chevy chase like trying to direct the script and oh jesus being arg argumentative and having his own ideas it was like right when he was at the peak of like i am the movie star now like i'm not like the tv star i'm the movie star well, it wasn't far off from the time when he did the television show the no, god no, awful no. at the height of his powers as you said travis this was i think that movie was around that time i don't know was that movie like 93 ish 92 91 92 yeah right no, there you go time. They say that made him even. Uh, they say that made a, a known cemented asshole an even bigger asshole after the failure of that show. He was just so pissed. At the <laughs> public, critics, everybody. A known cemented asshole. <laughs> what a beautiful term that is. Uh, Eric, what's on your mind today in the movie tidbit minute? Still working on workshopping the name. Michael Bay charged with killing a pigeon in Italy. <gasps> that was my other tidbit. That was my was backup it? tidbit. You're joking. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> he denies it on the set of ambulance that we had a uh intentional uh oh. murder of a, a pigeon my sources say six underground it was in the, of a oh I'm, my bad you're right you're right absolutely my bad uh yeah so uh i don't know he uh claims to be a big animal rights activist and that he's been careful all these 30 years but uh i mean the fact is bird died and all uh fingers are pointing to the bay and it wasn't a wild pigeon, as I understand it was a homing pigeon, which means it belonged to someone. It was a beloved pet, oh. uh, which really all pigeons were, you know, they all come from beloved pets because people just let them free sometime in the early mid 1900s. And that's why we have pigeons everywhere. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, great gift, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was Italy. The, I mean, the, the paperwork's being drawn up, but uh, Italy is very. Uh, um fervorous about the murder of their pigeons and uh you know this this couldn't look good on his uh <laughs> his resume pigeon murder never looks good for anyone it sounds like there's only one picture of it um like pigeon? one still frame of the image of the of the bird getting run over oh, but fuck. supposedly there's also a lot of footage from other angles angles of the bird not getting run over but from one angle it looks like it does that's what this is what meckle bay says and the second what? pigeon i, I <laughs> uh, <the laughs> one, it was in the grassy knoll that oh, grassy, grassy nest, <laughs> nesty knoll. Wow. The FK jokes. Knoll. We tried. That's, yeah, that's great. Tried. Nesty knoll. Tonight I'll do nesty knoll. Um, <laughs> who would start? Look, <laughs> uh, who looks bird like? Uh, looks like a bird. Boy, there's a lot of people who uh, look like Noah pigeons. Wiley. I think Noah Wiley yeah. could star in nesty knoll. Sorry, Noah Wiley. Noah Wiley. What an incredible poll. No, no, the no, last Noah person Wiley I would think Alan of. Tudyk star. Very special <laughs> nesty knoll. Yeah, Alan Tudyk. I can see that. I like it. Answer scare on Nesty Knoll this Thursday. <gasps> oh, man. That's right after all new Empty Nest with Richard Mulligan. Oh. All right. <laughs> Start. I like uh, what you did there. Going back to hour. Mr. Chase. Oh, okay. Two things. Mr. Chase. I thought he looked way too good, oddly enough, in the movie A Stupid and Futile Gesture, played by Joel McHale. I thought he didn't play him as a big enough dick, even though he was super sarcastic as Chevy Chase in that movie. I was surprised he wasn't a bigger dick. But yeah, that's just my opinion. And then, you know, I don't understand this. Friend of the show, Luke Horlbeck. We love Luke. He's a great guy. He's an old friend. Yeah. yeah. Uh, popping out a baby in a couple weeks. Get ready for that, Luke. Yeah. Reality's coming. You're sleeping. <laughs> Get you sleeping. Sleepers. But he Get loves Michael <laughs> Bay. He's always loved Michael Bay. And I, I just baffles me. I, I respect Luke's movie opinions a great deal. Strange. But this Michael Bay obsession is just always... Bum me out. He's found some like bullshit analytical critical bet where like Michael Bay is exposing the actual mirror of America to its, you know, it's like fuck all that. It, his, it is what it is in front of it, and I'm not having it. All right. So don't give me this crap about Michael Bay. Bay. Loophole somehow. 
Yes, I, he always you has. Give, you got to give Luke credit for having a fascinating approach to film, kind of like our, our friend Eric Brandstrom here. Uh, yeah. Keep you on your toes. You, you cannot guess what they will love or hate. But Revenge. There's, there's never an in-between. It's just That's love true. or hate. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. There, there are some similarities. I see that now. But <laughs> even Eric would admit, Michael Bay, come on. How can you be such a adored Werner Herzog fan and yet also appreciate something like pain and gain? <laughs> I think because he's a broad cinephile. I mean, people yes. can say the same things about us. Wait until we get into our so quarantine true, viewing picks. I'm sure we all watch mouth. something great and dumb. Mike, you got any, you got any <laughs> anyway, uh, right. Tim Bits for us to quote the other sister? Oh, man, I love Tim Bits. Uh, they're delicious. I think uh, it was that one. Isn't that what it tidbits. was with the other sister? Tim Bits? <laughs> no, odd Dogs and Tidbits. Yeah, tidbits. Well, you know, Tim bits are a real thing at Tim Hortons, so that's, that's delicious. So yeah. In Canada, we love it here. Tids, um, tids and bits. That's what it was. Tids and there bits. You go. Tids, and tids and bits. Tids and bits. We're Guys, I got huge news here on the composer front. <laughs> a 90-year-old man is not retiring? Is that <laughs> not over. It's not over for John Williams. He will not walk away, folks. He is not finished. The Fablemans is not his final film. He's not done. He's not done. He's coming uh, back for more, and we all my, will be better off for it. Third choice. We, like, we third definitely choice. have the same taste in like uh, cinema news, guys, because we, we all go to the same website five minutes before the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's really funny is I used to, I don't know where it was. I'm not like you. I, like Eric, you are just plugged in. You read all the movie website stuff, you know, screen rant. We, had, we covered this recently. I used to have somehow a way to draw in certain movie tidbits for myself like oh okay that's coming out down the road or that's starting to get going or, or there's talks all, all kinds of stuff like that and somehow what i've realized by starting this segment i was i don't really have that i don't know how i lost the stream i was cut from the feed or something you had uh, an algorithm going at some point <laughs> and um you didn't click enough times and your phone stopped feeding you the shit from variety and deadline <laughs> Damn it! Is that where it happens, was? Because right? yeah. Hollywood Reporter. That's what happens to me. Yeah. I was sick on the stuff. So that's every time you, you log it. Like I get on my Apple News, and it's like, "Hey, life is hell." Here's all the pol political stuff. You know, here's what's currently happening. And then it's like dogs, movies, <laughs> AI. Because I'm terrified. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, uh, Mike. It's it's tricky. Like I stick to like ComingSoon.net is my favorite because it's just stories. Like all my former favorite sites have moved on to like. Jared Carmichael wants an MCU role. Like, that's a story. <laughs> like, that sort of shit. You know what I mean? Of course he does. It's huge money. And, and I keep seeing articles like that with the RRR guys. They want to be in Marvel. Like, so do I. Yeah, he's interested in, be in a role. Yeah, of course they are. They're fucking free agents. <laughs> so dumb. Yeah, it's a, I'm thinking back to, like, 2007, you know? Like, yeah. I, I felt like I was really locked in. You know, like, when... The Dark Knight was coming out. Like you'd already read the script online somewhere in some secret website, mm -hmm. and I was still getting some news out. Like, oh, okay, wow, oh boy, little tidbits kept being revealed to me. Where was I? What was I connected to at that time in 2007? Where were those tidbits coming from? I, I honestly don't remember now. So, anyways, a little bit of you know a look back here. Pull at back the rate, curtain. It looks like we're gonna get one or two more John, John Williams scores. <laughs> Coming out yes. as a mortal, I'm not done. You're probably going to get one more before I die. Well, oh. he's 85, which I'm happy about. He's 89. Yeah. He's 90, right? He's 90. Yeah. He's 90. Hey, he's 90, man. It says yeah. he's 90 years of age on this one. We might be looking at the same article. I believe we are. <laughs> All right, there you go. That's our movie tidbit minute. I'm going to come up with a song. Maybe we'll have a little jingle here. It'll be fine. We need more jingles on this show. I love jingles. I also just realized on GarageBand, there's like 800,000 loops I could be playing with. I finally realized this last week. It blew my mind. I'm like, oh, my God, all these loops are in here and I can play with them? It sounds like real music. It's pretty wild. <laughs> so who knows what will happen in 2023 from a creative standpoint. But let's switch gears, as they say, into quarantine viewing picks where we share what we've been watching, what we thought was shit. Either way, was it a miracle? Was it the greatest movie of our lifetime? Let's find out. Travis Roy, take it away. Uh, I watched a lot of stuff, so I'll stick to just stuff that I saw for the first time. Uh, and I watched a lot of really good stuff, too. But I'll start with stuff that maybe wasn't so good. It was Nicolas Cage's birthday. He's a 59th birthday on January 9th. Uh, so I celebrated by watching one of the only Nicolas Cage movies I've never seen before. One I had kept in the hopper for some time, just waiting for that special occasion. And I watched Left Behind from 2014, which 
was <laughs> Christian Langoliers. Basically, it was Christian Langoliers, uh, and not nearly bad enough. I wanted to Christ be, Langoliers. Yeah, I wanted it to be so much worse. But so I, when it was over, I'm like, well, I wanted that to be worse, and it's still early. What am I gonna? How do I follow Left Behind? Well, you follow that Left Behind with a 1996 Whoopi Goldberg film, Theodore Rex. Oh, geez. um, which yes, you guys, I'm here to tell you, it was bad. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, had <laughs> me for a second there. All time bad. Uh, since I was sick, I dug into every single episode of Andor. Yes. Friend? Man, you know, we've talked last week about how Tony Gilroy is the main creator and writer of this show. Also, uh, Bo Will- Williman from House of Cards. I mean, these are some uh, some convoluted, convoluted plots. These are some deep characters. This is, um, I mean, before, I mean, th- it took me so long to watch this because I was just so burnt out on Star Wars. I was literally thinking, mm-hmm. I don't know that I'm going to watch Mandalorian season mm-hmm. three. I don't know that I'm going to watch any fucking star wars ever again yes! after uh the kenobi mm-hmm. show mm-hmm. and everything else that was coming before that and andor is a revelation you are 100 oh right God. about again you are 100 right about stellan skarsgård some of the best work of an amazing career <gasps> um i really think that he should have been nominated for some golden globes or something which we didn't talk about that i love that we we don't give a fuck about the golden globes here what am i talking about that <laughs> Uh, we'll talk about the SAG soon, but fuck the Golden Globes. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely great, and I'm very excited for season two. Yes, yes, it, um, I knew it. I knew it. It's nice yeah. to have your uh, your hopes and your confirmations confirmed about something because I thought it was really, really good, and you just confirmed it for me. So now, Eric, uh, you have no choice. You have yeah, to watch it. You'll I'll probably it hate it because we know you, and for some <laughs> reason it'll just, it'll go awry somehow. But I hope it doesn't. I really hope it doesn't. <laughs> Everyone who knows my taste told me I'd love it, and, uh, and I, you know, I got the, I watched like the first episode and a half and turned it off, and then I finished that first episode, you know, the second episode recently, and I was like, oh, that's still okay. I'll watch a third episode. That third episode, no spoilers, but when you see the juxtaposition of him getting on the planet versus him getting off planet, being presented at the same time, I am like, holy fuck, I am all in. This is great, <laughs> great television. Um, I watched The Pale Blue Eye, the new Scott Cooper film starring. Um, uh, what's his nuts? Christian Bale. This is, uh, <laughs> Oh, I know him. This was great. Yeah. This was great. A- awesome direction. Such, I mean, not enough films are set in the 1830s, heavy ravenous vibes for yeah. um, reasons that were beyond its control. Just the subject matter. Um, but Bale's doing was... old school period pieces recently with Amsterdam yeah. in this. Well, I mean, he's done before. I mean, you know, it's not his first 310 to Yuma. It's not his, it's not his first, but maybe he's really locking in. Maybe this is the next phase of his career. Hustles. Uh, maybe, maybe, but it was, I mean, he's a very convincing 19th century gentleman. I'll give him that. <laughs> uh, and he was great in this. I mean, I really liked, I really, really liked the pale blue eye. Mm. Um, I checked out, um, see how they run the, uh, new, uh, uh Sam Rockwell and Cersei Ronan kind of whodunit. The movie starts with the, fr- with, uh, one of the characters says it's a whodunit. You've seen one, you've seen them all. And they were right. Don't, don't bother with see how they oh, run. Oh, um, damn checked in with a documentary dio dreamers never die about the legendary <laughs> ronnie james dio what a life what a, what a fucking life this guy had he was making music before the beatles were on the scene and hmm. uh if you like dio at all it's it's on showtime and it's very much worth checking out just a, an american icon who never got the uh attention in this country that i think he deserves i checked out she said uh which was getting a lot of attention uh, this is a great film in the vein of the post and, uh, all the president's men. If you like a journalistic kind of movie, if you, this is the uncovering of the Harvey White Weinstein case. This is all the behind the scenes of that and expertly acted with, um, really, it's not just like they do such a great job of balancing this story that we're being told about the discovery of Weinstein's you know, disgustingness and also being given like this, these really very believable, well, they're based on real people, but very believable insights into these characters and their lives. And, and their and it's just, it's just a really well done movie. I will not be unhappy if, uh, if it gets a lot of attention, I think it deserves it. Um, Go ahead. So this is actually about, cause I, I saw a few things about that. This is actually about Harvey Weinstein. It's not like a, there's not like a pseudonym, like Henry Grillstein. It's like, this it, is, it is about this case. This, this is like the, the, all the president's men of Hollywood. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's everyone's, I mean, like, um, 
Ashley Judd plays herself. Gwyneth Paltrow's no voice shows up on screen. Like she she calls in in one scene, but she doesn't actually appear on screen. But like, I mean, like it's you know, Ro Rose, um, like all these people. Rose McGowan is a character. I mean, it's no all, it's, the, it's the whole thing, and it's really really good. I mean, it's really there was, good. yeah. There was a movie that came out. I think it was 2019. It was an immediate response to the mm -hmm. Weinstein chaos. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah, you remember the, the title. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah I yeah. saw it, and that yeah. was that was more what you're saying, Eric. Andy it wasn't. Grillstein. <laughs> yeah, it was all like shadowy. It's like, you know what we're talking about here, but yeah. we're not naming any names. It was very dry and it sounds nothing like what you're describing, Travis. Oh, so, uh, like, I'm I mean, like, yeah, like there, there's like producers, like real producers' names getting thrown in there, like people that were, you know, it's public record, um, you know, so. I, like I love really a good, good procedural. I know Eric's not a big I, procedural guy, but that's me. I love I a good of procedural. You. I thought of you watching the movie. I'm like, Mike's going to like this one. <laughs> Where's this at? Where can I see that? Uh, it's on Peacock right now. Ah, oh, fire. So I'll have to get a free subscription. Okay, thanks. Yeah, do the trial run. Um, I, I actually really like having Peacock for the record, but I also watched, um, what else? I watched some other good stuff. Okay, the, I got two more to talk about. I watched Tar. Everyone's talking about Tar. I had to watch Tar. Okay. If it wins Best Picture, I will not be surprised. If it wins, if if Kate Blanchett won, wins Best Actress, I will not be surprised. Um, I think it's it's the first movie I think I've ever seen where I've thought to myself a couple different things about the Academy Awards. For one, I've never watched a movie that wasn't like Top Gun Maverick or Wakanda Forever, which are expected to be in this category. I've never watched a movie and been like this. This is going to win Best Sound Design or uh, Best Sound Editing. Like this is going to get nominated at least for both of those categories. Um, it's really got some good stuff going on in that department um and i also thought to myself for the first time i could i would be happy if todd field wins best director for this i don't particularly want to win best movie i don't think it's the best movie of the year that i've seen um i find it really fascinating that this character that kate blanchett plays she name drops this woman named marin uh alsa uh alsap or aslop i'm fucking up the name i think it's Alsap, but she's like the oh i, I don't know anything about her uh, I don't know. She could be a wonderful human being. She could be a pile of shit. I know nothing about her except for that. She came out recently and said, like, this movie is not great because like it doesn't really, you know, it's about how power uh, it's, a, you know, it's about the abuse of power. And you're dealing with a lesbian woman here. But like this woman that is Marin Alsop is literally the only female conductor. She's a lesbian woman who is married to someone in her choir or in her, you know, in her orchestra. And a few other things, like she has like a baby, like an adopted daughter. There's like all these things about her, her, her life specifically that are exactly the same of the character of Lydia Tarr in the movie. And everyone's like responding to um, all stops. And again, I'm not sure about the name, but everyone's responding to her being like, oh, well, you just don't like that you know, challenging women or whatever. And it's like, well, no, I think that the movie's based on literally her and making her out to be a horrible human being. That oh. all, yeah, that all decide it's truly worth checking out i mean like there's a, a movie with this kind of buzz usually is there's a reason and there is a reason here mm -hmm. um i didn't love it i felt like a good half hour at least could have been chopped off of it like every other fucking movie including basic instinct but um ah! i don't know why every movie's gotta be two and a half hours anymore um hey, you know that what? was 92 though come on yeah that's true my favorite movie of that i watched maybe one of my favorites of the year i actually had to adjust my top 10 for this Mike, I can't believe that I've watched Clerks 3 before you. Holy shit. Oh, shit! I fucking loved it. Whoa. Yes, of course you did. God damn it. Where do I, I find it? It's like three bucks to rent on Amazon. I don't want to pay for it. Where is it free? I don't know, dude. It's a, it's America. You got to pay for things. Damn it. Wow. I also okay, don't go mind, give it to me. I don't mind shilling out three bucks to, you know, to, to support these guys. It was, it's, it's, um, this is not the movie of, uh, rebellious 20 year old it's not the rebellious of a contemplative like a uh, fart joke in 30 year old this is the movie of a man in his 50s who almost died it is and it, it is a comedy but man it is like if you're going in expecting clerks again in some ways it's exactly clerks again and in other ways it is extremely emotional and powerful um and and also in between i i loved it i really did hmm you see two. What, do you remember your reaction to two? Oh, dude, I I hated two. I saw <gasps> two. I saw two when wow. it came out, and well, hate's a strong word, but I I was never a fan. 
Yeah. Um, I love I, the first Clerks movie to me is like part of my life. It's like part of my DNA. I've seen it so many times. It's like Reservoir Dogs, you know. Um, but oh. it's uh, the second one to me was always. I'm like, why are you in color? Uh, why aren't you at the fucking <laughs> <laughs> restaurant at the quick stop? You know, like, like it just and and I just felt like a lot of the jokes were like. I don't know, just like, how can we top it with donkey dicks and shit? Like, how can we top what we did before? Mm. Um, so to me, I, I I never was crazy about Clerks 2. And I can see where some people will not be crazy about Clerks 3, but I, I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, I, wow. God, I, you know what happened real quick is that the last one, the 2019 Jay and Silent Bob reboot, is that what it is? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even watch that. Uh, it was just Horrible. so bogus, and I love this stuff. I live for Kevin Smith. I'm outside of his. Sk- I don't give a shit about all the yoga hoser stuff. That, that's not me. I'm talking oh. about like the the universe, this view skew universe that he created. I, I grew up on it. I like you, Travis. It's part of my DNA. I love all that stuff. Mall rats, all that chasing Amy. It's all classics to me. Dude, get on so it. I, yeah, I got to get on it. But when I saw the last one with the reboot, it really bummed me out. So that's probably why I'm slightly slow to the roll for this one. But I'm glad okay. to hear that. That makes me very very happy. Eric Brandstrom, let's hear what you could offer this week. Is it all God awful or is there hope for the future? <laughs> oh, well, well, we set a course to find a brand new island everywhere we roam. Travis. Moana. <laughs> Check it. back in. Weeped again. Um, yeah, I also watched The Pale Blue Eye, Travis. Um, I dug the film. I liked the movie. It was, I mean, it's Scott Cooper, so it's like, right laborious hour like like <laughs> so goddamn laborious this guy fucking take he doesn't give a fuck he's like takes his fucking time but yeah that last uh like that last 40 minutes was fucking fantastic i mean yeah. lucy boynton i'd watch do laundry for many many hours hey! but this guy henry melling the guy that played poe i'm sorry this guy's face always irritates oh. me it's well, always like every time i see this right? guy's face i get so irritated and his voice is so boring as poe and he's just so Boring as Poe in the movie. Like, I hated his Edgar Allan Poe. Mark my uh, words. Mark my words. He's going to be a big, big, big star. I think he's going to, I think he's going to be a really big. <sighs> that face. That face. Yeah. But yeah, I like the movie. Um, yeah, it's been, actually been kind of like haunting me for a few days. I dug it. Um, I, I dipped a toe back into uh, um, late 90s. Well, I you know, forget that. The Ninth Gate. <laughs> Ninth Gate by Roland yeah! Polanski. I hit play. Like I saw Johnny Depp. I'm like, fuck, I'm hitting play, Amelia. I don't care. Uh, I remember this being awful in the theater. I was bored out, out of my mind in theaters what? in 1999. But I decided to give it a shot because I love Johnny Depp. And it's it's a very, very odd. It's like intentionally goofy and silly <laughs> while also trying to be scary. Yes. Um, but like I was having fun. Like I, I was entertained by it. Like Langella is like straight goof times. And Johnny Depp is like, what am I doing in this movie? Uh, <laughs> it, I don't know, but I enjoyed it. I, I like the story. It's an interesting story. Yeah. Um, I love the night like gate, man. Oh yeah. yeah. I saw it at uh, my ex-girlfriend Brandy's in like 2003 for the first time. I watched it several times there on VHS. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun. The show. I mean, I haven't seen it since it was new, but I remember liking it. Ooh. Oh, I'm well, now that Eric saw it, he ruined it. Cancel everything. No, yeah, I'd watch it again. I'd watch it again. Yeah! Um, and then I watched 1408. I'm like, let's keep like these like like uh, like kind of like underrated sleeper hits going with 1408 starring John Cusack and Samuel Jackson. Uh, horrible. Awful. Still bad. Hated it when I rented it in 2007. It's, it's it sucks. Oh, so, like like the first half hour is so good. It's like this setup is awesome. Like this guy's going to go debunk this paranormal stuff. And then just a bunch of like CG ghosts and shit is flying around did for read, two hours. Did you read this, the novella or the story? So I have, and it's really faithful to it. So maybe that's partly why. I read is it. that good? Yeah, I mean, because this I, was I, awful. Well, I like I like fourteen oh seven too, or fourteen oh eight too. So mm-hmm. uh, do what you yeah, will. I can't that. recommend it, man. Uh, I don't know. This wasn't for me. Uh, ran out of gas. Like John Cusack plays an asshole in the movie, and since I know that like he's a total dick in real life, I spent <laughs> the movie just being like, "You prick." Um. <laughs> then I turned on Pirates of the Caribbean: The Curse of the Black Pearl. I'm like, it's been twenty years. I'm I'm giving this another shot because I've been bashing this long bloated turd. For 20 years so i turned it on disney plus so fucking boring i fell asleep like three times every time i woke up it was still on i'm like i feel like i'm totally refreshed and i've been sleeping for a long time how is this still on how am i still looking at um 
Jonathan Price making that same boring face, saying something boring about like naval war. <laughs> but it just never ended. And I remember, man, I've said this before. Like this is this is the time in theaters where I remember saying out loud, movies are changed now because this was like three hours long. And like studios just decided like, let's make it as long as possible. It doesn't even care. Like who cares what the story is about? Who cares about anything? <laughs> let's have a bunch of noise and a very loud Hans Zimmer music. And we got a movie. People would be happy, right? No. I detest these films. Like I love Johnny Depp and I like his Jack Sparrow, but like uh, hated, he might be honest with the movies. Yeah, so I don't like boring. them either. There's like five um, yeah. of them, and they're all so boring and long and loud and stupid. <laughs> loud. <laughs> a friend of the show, Jamie Andrews, has a great Jack Sparrow costume, and he's worn it many times. He does Fantastic. it to a T, but otherwise, yeah, trash. It's, it's weird because it's a great character in a in a franchise I could just never get into. I'm like, I love this character. Yep. Don't like anything yep. that's happening around him. Yeah, it's based on a goddamn amusement ride. I mean, what the that's shit, that, yeah. man? Well, you know. Sit. You think Jumanji, like eight-year-old yeah. kids are are sitting there watching this romance between Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley and giving a shit? Because that's all the movie is, except for like uh, these like, parcels of Jack Sparrow every now and then. Well, there's a lot of comedic really relief though from side characters you don't care about. Don't forget that. Uh, too bad it wasn't funny. Hate those films, and that's about it, man. All right. Gore Verbinski strikes again. Yeah. yeah, strikes out again. I like I like a lot of his stuff personally, mm -hmm. but I don't like those. <gasps> wow. Mouse hunt? Come on, mouse hunt. Mouse hunt. <laughs> mouse hunt. <laughs> Roadhouse. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got something to offer here in quarantine viewing picks, which is a lot of fun for me. And look, I'll keep it real. I watched the made off documentary. And by the time you someone had already yes. made the joke in our text mm -hmm. thread about it, yes. I'd already watched it. It was already over. I'd, <laughs> I just consumed that shit, you know, I, sure 2008 you and Wall Street and all these mm -hmm. scumbags. It's endlessly fascinating to me because, first off, it's really impacted my real life. And I guess maybe I have more buy in. In fact, if actually most of you stop and look around, it impacted your life, too. But right. made off. What's really sucked is now that we have a 15 year legacy and Travis, you know, this is great. We got a little bit of a historical lens now because we're 15 years gone and he really took the brunt for everybody in the end. And it sucks. He, it was like the perfect timing to have the ultimate scumbag take the cover when we, I wonder if God, if Madoff hadn't existed, there would have been some different, it would have been a little bit different. I really believe that he was such a scumbag on such an epic scale with his tentacles across the world. Like the documentary talks about in Europe and all this stuff. Uh, and that guy who killed himself feels so bad for that guy. I mean, I don't like rich people, but even I don't want a guy to kill himself. Uh, right. No, because no, I don't want that for anybody. No. So, but it wasn't just him, <sighs> right? Oh, no, 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 no. Right. Um, quick thing on, on to go back to Andrew real quick. One of the things I really love about th that show is that the rest of the star Wars stuff often makes it seem like the emperor and Darth Vader and like a few key figures are like, if they were just removed, everything would be fine. Um, but fascism and uh, economic corruption and uh, you know, uh, untethered capitalism that this predatory capitalism, all that stuff. I mean, like it's, it's well beyond Bernie Madoff. Oh, that's beautiful. What you just said there, boy, I want to watch Andor right now. Uh, <laughs> Darth Madoff. Darth Madoff. <laughs> But the, and then uh, you know, Moff Madoff. Yeah, Mo Grand Moff <laughs> Madoff. Oh, there you go. There, there you it go. is. It's one of his sons killed himself because of this, and then his other son died of leukemia. I just don't think those are coincidences at all. I mean, that it's fucked up, man. I mean, how did Bernie? If he's a sociopath, then he lived with it because he lived with that for fifty years. And the question is, there. would you be Bernie Madoff if you got to live that good life for fifty uh, years, and then no. things ended the way they did? No, is that up for debate? No, it's not. Well, not for me. <laughs> We just talked about how he like helped ruin the lives of many people. Why would I want to be him? Yeah, like tens of thousands of people. Yes, yeah. you're right about that. No, I don't want to be him. I just like to throw that out there. All right. Uh, it's a well-done documentary, though. It's got the good balance of taking you inside and trying to like recreate the world as it was in the time without having actual verbal reenactments. You know, like you would see on a I don't know, unsolved mysteries or something like that. <laughs> like it, and it makes it. Exactly. No dramatizations, but it does like physical dramatizations, no verbal ones. It takes you in there, creates the world for you and like, oh, wow. OK. And then it it like seamlessly transitions into a, a someone being interviewed, talking about the real stuff going on. I really liked it. I, I thought it was a rock solid documentary. And if you want to be bummed out and think about Madoff for four episodes, you know, 
I don't okay. see why you wouldn't want to do that, right? It's not like fun, Eric. <laughs> a blast. <laughs> There's a lot of Madoff movies too. You know, there was the made for TV ABC ah. one with Richard Dreyfus. Of course. Oh yeah, and, and then there the, was and the Robert De Niro one, which I forget the name. of Wizard that one. of Lies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, it's actually I kind of enjoyed Dreyfus's made off a little bit more, mm. but Wizard of Lies is a better movie because it's got a, a what's his face, our Greek guy from the shitty Sopranos prequel. Uh, yeah, Alessandro Nivola. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he plays uh, one of the sons. He's great in that. So that would be my recommendation for you if you want to get into the made off world. You want to take it to another level. You want to get depressed. Yeah, go ahead. But if you're also willing to accept the reality of life. By the way, I never saw this. There was a New Yorker or New York Magazine photo of Bernie Madoff as like the Heath Ledger Joker on the cover. Oh, my God. It's fucking terrifying. It's awful. <laughs> it's really freaky, man. I don't like it at all. It really stuck with me for a few days. Ugh. But, uh, yeah, check it out. All righty, and then uh, I watch other things. I, I'm watching a lot of Family Guy for me, which yeah. is bizarre because, man, I, I just watched Family Guy nonstop forever, and then I hadn't seen any new seasons. I'm like eight seasons behind now because I just lost touch with it, but sure. I was a real pleasure. I got to tell you, you talk about your all-time comfort watches. Man, I, I just banging out episode of Family Guy after Family Guy, five hours straight, playing some video games. It's so comforting for me. And I'll do a lot of, ha! A lot of those over, <laughs> like, ha, ha, ha! After the, maybe every 15, I'm telling you, I don't give a shit what anybody says about that show. I see <laughs> the funny in it. I always have. It's stupid as hell. I love stupid. And I love, like, a bunch of different things in one episode, like 10, 12, 15 different jokes about anything. That's my style. I like it, and I still enjoy it to this day. So I don't know if Family Guy's canceled or what, but it's still on the air, and they still make money from it. So that's nice. That's you know, that's <laughs> that is beautiful. You are beautiful. And uh, I watched Get a Job. Anybody get a job? Get a job. Get a life, Chris yeah. Elliott. Love Get a Life, Chris Elliott. That's a great show. REM intro. That's how I was introduced to that song through that show. But I didn't like Get a Job. Get a Job stars Miles Teller and Anna Kendrick. And hmm. you're, you're like, oh, okay, this is hopeful. Allison Bree, who I love. Yes, and, yes. where do I find uh, this? When did this come out? <laughs> oh, yeah. I know, it came out in 2016. It kind of just like, huh. it was around the same time as uh, the when Teller did the what was it called? Uh, War Dogs with Jonah Hill and Todd Phillips. It was that same time frame. Yeah, I missed that. Which too. was also not great. Yeah, also War not dogs. great. Dude, get a job is terrible. It is so bad. It's got <laughs> McLovin in it, Christopher Mintz Platts, and it's got a bunch of people. You're like, oh, that person's funny. Like the guy who plays the booty sweat Al Pacino in oh, yeah. Tropic yeah. Thunder, he's mm -hmm. in it. I'm like, oh, it's that guy. There he is. I thought he'd but, do at least one other movie. <laughs> and he did. Monster cast. <laughs> oh, it's fucking terrible, though. It's so bad. It's so, so. Oh, my God. Marsha Gay Harden shows up in it. I'm like, why are you in this movie, Marsha Gay Harden? What have you done to yourself here? Is she distraught it's... in it again? <laughs> no, no. She's a powerhouse, right? Am I getting the right person? Marsha Gay Harden? Yeah, yeah. She's just yeah, always angry. distraught. She's, well, no, she's, she's turned into a... Yeah, she often plays a strong, strong woman, too. Like, I mean, like, yeah. on, like on the morning show and that kind of stuff. Yeah, like yeah. You don't fuck with me. Yeah, yeah. I'll she fuck kind you of, up. Or uh, she's also on... Uh, uh, the Gilded Age, I think she's on that, too. Also playing like a don't fuck with me kind of woman. <laughs> oh, I got to see that. So get a job so bad. It's on Netflix. I'm sorry I watched it. I, Travis, remember we both, I think, said we enjoyed the TV show Flaked with Will Arnett? Remember that I one did, came yeah, out? Yeah, I liked Flaked. Yeah, I loved it when it came out. I went back and watched it with Leanne. And it was only two seasons. It yeah. didn't work out. Boy, I really liked it a lot less. I yeah. was really much more annoyed by the Will Arnett character mm. and what a scumbag he is and how it just, it is, he's allowed to be a scumbag. I'm like, how long do I have to put up with this guy's fucking decision making? A whole, <laughs> a second season now? I, I turned it off. I actually stopped. I'm like, Leanne, I'm turning this off. I'm turning it off right now. I, I'm supposed to put up with this guy's bullshit again for another season. I'm not doing it. <laughs> it was really weird response, but I, uh, I had enough. 
It's not one I've gone to revisit. Maybe there's a reason why. So it's funny. That's again, that's the whole premise of the show, our show. I mean, but there's sometimes stuff that you see and you're like, this is fucking great. And then you go back and watch it. And like, obviously it hasn't changed, but yeah. you have. And it's just not what it was. Oh. It's Michael, so real quick, you know, the director of Get a Job, Dylan Kidd, did Roger Dodger. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Tough Open times. Mom. Wow. wow! I didn't know wow. that. That's a big. That's a big uh, tidbit. That's a movie tidbit right there. Uh, what is it? Tim bits. Uh, bit tids and bits. Tids and bits. Um, flaked. Sorry, it didn't go the way I thought it would go. The way I wanted it to, especially as it's it's about like recovery from addiction and drug stuff, and it's just not the same anymore. Will and I, I still love you though. It's not your fault. It's clearly me. I have changed in 2023. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer the man I used to be. I'm half the man. Eh, that's pretty much it. Oh, okay. one more. What, uh, White Boy Rick. That movie sucks. Oh, and I like that movie. Got- oh, see, that's what sucks, Eric, is I wanted to like it so, so much. That's the second time I've seen it. And mm-hmm. I also listened to White Boy Rick, the person himself, who the movie is about, absolutely shit on the movie <gasps> and say it is a total piece of garbage, a farce, and has nothing <laughs> to do with what happened. So if the guy who it's about... When the movie is gritty, it looks gritty. It's blue as hell. It's very, <laughs> it's very uh, mm-hmm. narc, like narc esque yeah. winter Detroit colors. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's like they all have like a Detroit palette they automatically yeah, go to yeah. when they do so, a Detroit film. We talked about this yellow Mexico, blue Detroit. <laughs> Travis, you live like, pretty much did Metro Detroit. Look out the window. Is it blue? That's gray. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, dude. It sucks because you got McConaughey trying to do some great work, and he does. McConaughey's great yeah, in the movie, awesome. and uh, even the guy, the kid who played White Boy Rick in the film was... He, he played a really good, like, clueless intellect underneath the skin type guy. I was impressed by that, but the movie's all bullshit, so now it's just a bit bummed me out, and after knowing that, I just want people to know, if you watch White Boy Rick on Netflix, dismiss it. It's... I mean, you want to entertain. You want to. It's such a compelling, true to life story. So There's no need the to bullshit. Story, yeah, why not just I tell know. what actually happened? And it's by uh, the writer, uh, the screenwriter, uh, uh, Sil- Michael Silver. Uh, someone Silver. You know what I'm talking about here. He's a really acclaimed, and he does Silver? a lot of. Yeah, somebody Silver. And he's a great writer, screenwriter. He does a lot of screenplays. Uh, but anyways, I guess he kind of got pushed aside. These other guys took over. So. It's a bummer. White Boy Rick, not what you hope for. Maybe there's a better day ahead. I don't know. That's it. Sometimes things don't go your way. But hey, Cinema Night Podcast, things can go your way anytime you want to because you can watch any of our episodes on YouTube. Just fire it up. Oh, I'm going to watch the one on uh, waiting. You know, I wasn't a part of it, but if you want to watch it, go ahead. Uh, you can watch any of our episodes anytime. YouTube.com. Cinema Night Pod. All right. That's our movie Commercial? Was that a commercial? That was weird. Let's get into <laughs> Basic Instinct. It is now time to focus in... What is Mike talking about? Eric uh, selected I mean, Basic... Yeah, who knows what's like, happening. If he's, if he's questioning what he's talking about, you know... Then we're in real trouble. Yeah. You're right. Basic Instinct, 1992 film selected by Eric Branstrom here, starring Michael Douglas, Sharon Stone. What a film we got on our hands here. So let's dive right into it. We always do. For those of you that are new to the show at all, you're seeing us for the first time, we like to open it up. With our first times recalling our original viewing experience of the film. And then we'll get into critical analysis, yada, yada, yada. And then we'll get deep into all the details of the film. So, Travis, do you remember the first time you watched Basic Instinct with your pants down? <laughs> <laughs> ah, um, I watched it with my brother and my pants were up. Okay. Um, okay. This movie was a cultural juggernaut. When it came mm. out, it made, it made $350 million, which is more than twice that in today's money. It was a huge, huge hit. So even as a 12-year-old, I had heard about this movie. So when it came out on VHS, my older brother rented it from the, v- you know, from the store down the street. We were alone a lot. No one really... You know, carded us or anything so i watched this movie at like 12 years old when it came out um <laughs> i smart enough to disinfect the vhs before you uh touched it <laughs> no it's hard to do anything i was 12 um yeah and i you know i watched it then uh we may have rewatched one specific scene a couple times and uh never saw it again since until wednesday night <laughs> Okay. That's my story. Well, you, Eric, you remember? I mean, Eric, 
this Dude, is in the heyday where you weren't allowed to watch it when it came out. Yeah, no, you, I couldn't even no watch way. the USA ver the televised version. I didn't even watch the NBC <laughs> primetime movie version. Uh, no, no, I grew up looking at this cover box, Michael Douglas's steamy back, front and center. <laughs> And I couldn't watch it. I did. I knew about the infamous scene, but I didn't see it. So I didn't. I did not wear my pause button out on this one back in the early nineties. By the way, that scene is totally overrated. It's not even like that obvious to me. Like it's like, good God. We might as well get out of the way early because I mean, it so has overshadowed the rest of the movie, and it really shows yes. how puritanical and weird our <laughs> culture is to be. <laughs> so obsessed with this vagina i mean there are american culture like any american. european watches this they're like what's a big fucking deal <laughs> what are yeah. you guys talking about yeah. <laughs> it's shadowed shadowed vagina at best there's really you don't even see anything also uh we got to bring it up sharon stone has said that she did not know she was being bullshit. filmed for that and I she is her. pissed at paul bullshit. verhoven what do you so. mean bullshit what the fuck do you know are you there I do not believe her she's just trying to get back in the news you can, you can not believe her if you want to but you can't <laughs> say it's bullshit because you don't know it was and for and for two it was part of her memoir it wasn't like something that she went out of her way to to uh say and also people don't that know was, that was the most recent time she's gone on the record four different times in her life with the same story saying that she was under the impression <laughs> that that the white underwear was reflect i mean it, it does sound wishy-washy i will Hello. give you that like why you think you have to take off your underwear for the shot and then you're surprised but uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, i don't know exactly but, but also i don't know it's whatever the case it's out there now she's embraced it and the fact that it has overshadowed everything else is so weird didn't we watch a movie recently where we saw like an erect penis in it we were like commenting during our, our conversation later like there was someone's like there was dong in it it was even there was even like a hard dong at one point i remember we talked about this what movie was that what what eric brown bunny <laughs> no oh, it, was, not, a, it yeah. was a movie that we watched it was i watched the, the uh yeah, I, I remember, the pam and tommy I show the pam and tommy show there's a ton of dong in that with sebastian stan and a talking dong a talking hard dong almost actually but you're not gonna i mean you're gonna have uh, mike miniature superheroes crawl into dongs on tv in 2023 but you're not gonna see a single vj <laughs> yeah. Mm. Right. Well, you know, when did you first see this movie, Mike? I'm sorry, we got don't. No, 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 no. The thing we're talking about the scene because it is. We have to bring it up. Yeah. And you're right. I don't want it to dominate the conversation, but I want to get it out of the way now. And Verhoeven is a well-respected, outstanding filmmaker. He's a mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. filmmaker. He's got his own sensibilities. He's clearly not. Uh, he got naked too in his own movies. By the way, he did. He he took off his clothes as the director to make his actors feel more comfortable. He's done that because he's very comfortable being naked and well, clearly, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, here you go. Like, that's great. I'm all for that. The Sharon Stone's memoir, you know, you do want to sell books. I get that. But at the same time, if it happened to her, it happened to her, and I cannot prove it for sure. Nobody can say anything because we'll never be there. We weren't there. And it sucks. But it's also, there are scumbags like Harvey Weinstein. The biggest scumbags ever who control people and exploit them sexually. And then there's also people who are willing to do anything to be on screen. So how am I supposed to have an answer? There is none. All these yeah. things exist. My head's going to explode. That's how I think of <laughs> it really Good in answer. the end. So. Good answer. Um, my first viewing, boy, is either my grandfather or my dad. Sorry, dad. I know you uh, listen to our show now. So <laughs> um, boy. bring on the masturbation I, jokes early. Let's get them out of the way. <laughs> I feel like written. it was, uh, yeah, one of them had a copy, like a, a recorded copy. My grandfather, he had a massive collection of copied VHSs. He would rent them from Blockbuster, and he was the guy. He dubbed them all. He's the guy yeah. who they want to avoid. He didn't sell them to anybody, but he had, I mean, we're talking hundreds, and he even bought his own brown plastic cases to put them in, and they were numbered. We're yeah. talking like 520 tapes all across the walls. Yep. So I feel like that's where I ran into this movie for the first time. And whether my dad got it from him or not, I don't know. I'm sure my dad borrowed a bunch of movies. Like, hey, I'm going to take these, dude. And, uh, yeah, I, I watched it in the basement of the Rosemont House in Detroit. Somewhere around somewhere around my teenage years where masturbation was in vogue. Mm. I'll say that. In so, vogue. In vogue. Yeah. Is that like definitely, the, <laughs> the, 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 the album, the band? <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's like, yo, in vogue, yeah. They're oh, in vogue's always in vogue. They always will be to me. But I watched it alone and I definitely was like watching it as a 
a masturbatory experience. I'm not going to lie to you folks. <laughs> However, the first right? time I watched it as a non-masturbatory experience, mm. I was like 25. I was in the 2000s. I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch this. Okay, I, I can. I don't have to take off my uh, pants. <laughs> I can just watch this film. So great. I, fi- great. I finally did that. The word masturbatory into yep. this uh, episode. Much I got to tell you, man. I got to <laughs> tell you, I, I can't hide from it. And it's just so overwhelming, and uh, I'm not a scumbag. I think I'm a decent guy. I'm, I've made some mistakes in my life. I'm a moron. You know, I've I've broken up with people. They've dumped me, and we've said things we regret. But I'm a decent human being. But <laughs> <laughs> I will but. say that it's a hard but. You, uh, hard but. But I touch like, myself. <laughs> like, what I feel shame about and tell people sh- in public years I, later. It's the, Sharon Stone is so beautiful. I mean, she's just so sexy. She is such an icon. I mean, and this film is it. This obviously this is like imagine if like imagine if like one of the biggest stars of your era, think about, I don't know, recent times or something, decided to do like a hardcore sexy thriller like this where she was in the buff a ton it's just mind-blowing to me because i'm like wow I, she, to me she's just an all-time sex icon and i respect the hell out of her for being that even in total recall but her first it's not her first verhoven film by the way this was her second and she was i was like oh who's that she's kicking ass and she was super hot so and she's a great actress too she's the total package i love sharon stone i always will she's just an icon for me for all times and that's how i feel about that what the critics think Oh, okay. Yeah, let's get to critical analysis. <laughs> oh, you're a funny guy. You're the kind of guy I like to hang Justin out with. Justin Thompson is a great critic and a fine father and son, but <laughs> he touched himself. Uh, what is uh, the rating, guys? Oh, an IMDb six point nine seems appropriate to me. This was a this was a monster. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it like seven five. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Eric. I'm going to crank over 7. Uh, it feels like a 7-2, a 7-1. That's my guess. Actual retail price! Oh, as the vagina shot just playing on the base. On the, <laughs> damn it, IMDb, come on. Wow. 7.0. Oh, class. 7.0. I was very close. Mm. Yeah, you were. And it's Three. rising in popularity right now. It's actually in the top 500 right now. <laughs> it's funny. Popularity, which is weird. Okay. Uh, is there a basic instinct renaissance brewing? Eric, do you know something about this? Is that why you chose this film? 30-year anniversary. Uh, yeah, just had the 30-year anniversary. Yeah, that's fine with me. I like that. Okay. It's also in as 4K, as- so you can really get in there and see what uh, <laughs> what you can see or not, what you can detect without all the <laughs> glare of the whatever the fuck. <laughs> Did you got? you guys know if you were watching like the director's cut or not? I could find. By the way? Yeah, it was like an extra 40 seconds or something in the director's cut. You get to see, I don't know, maybe a second shot of the VJ, and you get to see an ice pick go in the dude's eye in the beginning. Yes! That's what shocked me the most. That That's what I was like, oh, wow, I don't think I've actually seen the director's cut. Because mm. that ice pick to the guy's eyeball in the opening scene, I was like, whoa, I do not remember that. That was violent. You know what's also wild is she gave that actor a fucking heart attack. Or like she <laughs> knocked him unconscious. Maybe not a heart attack, but, but she knocked him unconscious, yep. pounding on his chest over and over and over <laughs> again with the ice pick, filming it, and she literally made him unconscious. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Good I God. also love the fact that they brought in legendary makeup man Rob Botine just for yeah. that incredible yeah. opening shot. Oh, <laughs> just, I, yeah, but they then cut out. <laughs> oh, Rob Botine, like his best work on the on the cutting room floor. <laughs> it looked pretty good. I was like, oh shit, yeah, that was yeah. intense. I wonder uh, if I'm Rob Botine had a hand in Michael Douglas's sagging old butt cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought he looked good. Still, he was. This ninety two. He was. He was hanging on. He was no Sharon Stone. Obviously, also, he did not I mean, deserve to be with her. But there's always there's always talk about Sharon Stone and her boldness and her body and all that stuff. But man, Mike, Michael Douglas is holding nothing back in this movie. I mean, it's just like butts and 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 I'm choking girls and like I mean, it's just like it's raw. It's but it. I mean, Verhoeven is doing here what he's done with RoboCop and a million other movies, just not with violence. He's like, well, I'm going to use sex and violence and give you a whole bunch of it. <laughs> sex and violence! <laughs> well, on Rotten Tomatoes, the sex and the violence was a splat for the critics, unfortunately. A 57%. Critics don't get it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 63, hmm. though, from the audience, a little higher. That's still just pretty enough. middling. It is middling. It's technically a buttered tub of popcorn but it's close it's very close you're right as far as what the critics had to say they've always got opinions and i'm sure they had a ton i mean basic instinct like you said eric was a a powerhouse big deal big film a lot of people had commentaries on it and people like 
Richard Schickel of Time Magazine. Let's see what yeah. Richard Schickel said. Rick Schick. <laughs> hey, Rick Schick. Dick Schick. The film has a smug the film has a smug faith in the ability of its own speed, smartness, and looks to wow L U X E. Uh Lux. To wow the yokels. I have not heard that word used like that. Uh, maybe I don't know what it means as much as I thought I did. Thanks Either a way, lot. Mocking Dick the audience. She. Yeah, we're yokels. Uh, how about Carrie Ricky of the Philadelphia Inquirer? Call me a prude. Uh oh. Goodbye. <laughs> but it's not sexy watching an erotic thriller in which every time a couple does it, one of them gets it with an ice pick. I don't care how many <laughs> firmly toned tummies and tushies are bared. Is there a dumber word than tushy? T tushy. tushy? Tushy. Tushy. She's very prudish. You're it's funny that there's a song that was made by ZZ Top. Tush? This is popular. That <sighs> blows my mind. Popular in your world, maybe. No, not. No. Just it's Pop popular. popular. It's not my song. I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, boy. Let's see. Uh, man, we got a lot of different. Oh, Peter Travers, Rolling Stone. Oh, yeah, Once upon a time. Oh, Petey. Verhoeven cinematic wet dream delivers the goods, <laughs> especially when Sharon Stone struts on with enough come on carnality to singe the screen. He gives it a thumbs up. He's got that's a fresh tomato. He likes it. I guess he likes Verhoeven's wet dream. And then <laughs> that's, what, that's the gist. Oh boy, you guys are gonna be excited. We got two more. Roger Ebert says. Eebs. Way back in the day, Roger was covering film at this time, so this was brand new. This film is like a crossword puzzle. It keeps your interest until you solve it. That is just a worthless scrap with the spaces filled in. <laughs> <laughs> he yes. was, man, he was something. Wow. That's beautiful. What a great, that's great. And then finally, Dessa Thompson. There is. Yes. And possibly the most, most abbreviated. Yes. <laughs> One word? One word. So, so close. Not quite. A predictable surprisingly uninvolving affair yeah you know succinct as always there's a reason we love him we make jokes yeah. but he, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, jokes, but there's, there's concision in that right. statement predictable <laughs> and you don't care <laughs> he's right <laughs> so yeah well let's talk about the mystery itself then it, is it convoluted so it confused people on the first wash? But then once, if you ever saw it again, you're like, oh, this is stupid. Or they give it away. I mean, there's an. Have you ever seen this? I wrote this down in my notes. Fade out, fade in at the end. Fade out. No, we're coming. We're fading back in. Psych. I'll show you the ice pick. He yep. all but said psych. Um, yeah. And it was almost too fast of a fade back in. I'm like, well, we've barely gotten to black here. We're already back. Hang on. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so there's a few things that, you know, since I, since I saw this when I was a little kid, basically, when this was brand new, um, there was very little that stuck out in my memory. Um, things that you know, obviously a scene we've covered the opening scene, which we've also covered and the final scene which you know, the three things that really stuck out in my memory. So it was effective. It stayed in my mind because I remember even as a kid being like um, kind of on the fence if she was or was not the killer as a 12 year old. With a 12 year old's intellect, I was unsure. As a 42 year old man watching this movie, I'm like, this is the most telegraphed, repeatedly telegraphed murderer I've ever seen on film. She's just repeatedly <laughs> telling everyone how she's killed, who she's killed, how she's going to kill again, when she's going to kill them personally, when she's going to kill their partner. I mean, it's like, she's just like, it's, there's no foreshadowing. It's like a fucking brick to the face. Not to mention the, the clear fact that, it is Sharon Stone in the opening scene, and it looks like <laughs> Catherine Trammell. Um, well, that's why they introduce. <laughs> that's why they introduce placebo Catherine uh, Catherine Trammell, not Trammell. Roxy Trammell with Roxy, right? So you mm. can think maybe it was her, but then they kill her <gasps> off halfway through, anyways, which would completely deflate that. And then at the yeah. end of the movie, so to jump ahead drastically, since we've already gotten to that point, like of course she's not going to kill Nick at that point because she just turned Beth into the perfect scapegoat. She's gotten away with the crime. If she kills Nick, then she <laughs> fingers herself. You know, that's not what I wanted to say. Want to she, uh, uh, incriminates herself. Yes. There you go. There you go. And by the way, this is a Joe Esterhaus script, as Eric mentioned last week. <laughs> yeah. Joe Esterhaus, he does basic instinct. 
And then right after that, they're like, hey, we got to do another sexy thing. Let's do Sliver, which is a shit movie. What about Strip Girl? Uh, a strip Club. And, 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 then, and then Showgirls in 95 Girl. to put the death sentence on his career. <laughs> That's it. Jade. So. Well, there was that throat oh, cancer. Oh, Jade. That, okay. Yeah. That throat cancer didn't help. And then he came out and apologized for encouraging smoking in all of his movies. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. That's fun. Yeah. I, also, there are hints early hints of showgirls in this movie i wrote it down i'm like wow you know uh the dance scene at the club with like <laughs> <laughs> which is like i'm watching you i'm watching you dance i'm watching you dance i'm watching you dance Michael very Douglas bizarre dance standing there dancing is apparently just grabbing your partner's ass and oh yeah he, still. he couldn't show any rhythm he's like i'm just gonna kind of grab up your butt cheek and That's you're gonna be like oh. dancing of course, before I go to a disco, I make sure when I open my wardrobe that I select the hottest <laughs> looking sweater vest I can find. V-neck! The fucking V-neck, man! The it makes me laugh every time! Every time it comes on screen, Eric, I laugh! I don't know why! Like, he's at this like edgy club and he's got his V-neck on like it's 1977 sweater. or something. It's weird. He's, uh, he's funny. A he's a little this movie's old. so funny at times, unintentionally. Unintentionally. But, yeah, so Esther Haas, his career, but there are showgirl hints. I just felt like, oh, yeah, I could see how he was already thinking about the script of this movie because it's and it's not just the dancing. It's, you know, the sexiness, obviously, the the cheesiness of certain stuff and the way it's written. Like, is this the all-time, guys, the all-time cop one-liner movie that there ever was? Like, it's just an endless barrage when they come out of crime scene of of jokes. And <laughs> Looks and, like uh, some yeah. very civic-minded, very respectable cocaine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah shit I, like that. There's a lot of there's a lot of pretty good dialogue and some <laughs> just terrible dialogue. But yeah. either way, a lot of dialogue. Yeah, and the way mm -hmm. they yeah. talk about this case at the the. Uh, police station somebody says something and then someone comes in yeah he was on coke yeah uh we got dna everywhere yeah uh we called somebody yeah. it's like bing bang boom it's like this is not is this it all DNA happens everywhere. like this streamlined so fast incredible mm -hmm. you people are the best detectives in the world dna everywhere one of the very first lines of the film is i quote there's cum stains all over Damn. the street. i was no, saying no, no, that no, 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 the no, end no there's cum, <laughs> yeah. there's there's, cum stains there's cum. All, all over the bed there it is yeah, that's like you gotta do the all oh, gotta drag that all out yeah yeah that's great by the way uh this is a carol co picture guys i noticed that at the beginning sure. that's fun yeah bye bye carol sleaze co bag fa sleaze bag movie factory <laughs> Yeah, I, okay, how about this fucking score? This how score. much can they shove it down our throat? I mean, I like Andrew. the score because it reminds me of Basic Instinct right away, but there's, like, no scene. They can't put it in underneath the dialogue. What? I didn't catch that last part. There's, I know. There's no scene. They can't put it in underneath the dialogue. It's oh, okay. great. It's like, yeah. I, I know. I, I it's get like fired Jerry up. Goldsmith signs on and like he creates one like musical cue and then like gets fired. And they're like, well, I guess we just got to keep playing this over and over again because we don't have yeah. any other music. Nominated for a Academy Award and a Golden Globe. Yeah. I love the it's score. Memorable. Like, it, it, yeah. I love how it plays over the proceedings. It's very like old fashioned. Reminds me of like 30s, 40s out of the past yeah. film noir. Yeah. Well, yeah, then it gets blanchard it all over the place. Exhausting. <laughs> it's a verb. Um, blanchard. Yeah, this is this movie's very much a hearkening back to like classic California 40s noir. Yes. It's like what, what if we made a noir movie now mm -hmm. and we showed titties? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not not very mysterious. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Also, uh, this is a Mario Kassar uh, production. Which, uh, <laughs> yep. Whenever I see his name, I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. that guy. And Jan very... on, um, on the camera. Yeah! Yes. Yeah. That's the other oh, guy. Really. He recovered from the, the lion incidents of Roar by this point. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you uh, know what? I mean, one thing that really struck me, because part of you wants to be like, um, well, like, okay, let, let me... I was maybe kind of ready to go in with a preconceived notion that this movie is going to suck. But <laughs> there was some absolutely gorgeous shots when Nick mm -hmm. and Catherine are first introduced to one another. And she's out there on the lake. Oh, uh, the, the pairing of Verhoeven <laughs> with Jan de Bont, Like, I mean, the way that I mean, like, I'm not talking about the whole scene because the scene is fucking stupid. But the way it's shot <laughs> looks fantastic. The way the whole it the is. whole left side of the screen mm -hmm. like turns to white and stuff. What? OK, go ahead, Mike. What What is what tickles your funny? <laughs> about so funny. When, when he when she showed on screen for the first time at the beach at the beach house. Yeah. 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 She turns around and makes this like goofy, stupid look. It just makes me laugh. She's like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's not her fault. She's a great actress. I still love her. It just makes me laugh. It's a weird, like, oh boy, who am yep. I there intro. But yeah. it does, it looks great. This movie looks really good, Travis. You're right. Yeah. And there's a yeah. lot of shots like that. I mean, there's shot like there's a shot of the two of them uh, in a car together, and the and the like the light is on their face. And you can see the rain drizzling down across their face, and like both of them are half lit. There's there is some truly gorgeous, perfect shots in this mm-hmm. film. Like mm-hmm. really good. Two like, two excellent car chases shot with like frenetic energy, no bullshit. Like. Ooh, too many close up. Oh, it's a, a tense scene that first that first mm-hmm. car awesome. chase. Um it's awesome but it's stupid because oh, yeah. I mean, like yeah. it's just like this is way over the top. No no one would do this. Yeah. Like, it's no insert, car <laughs> chase, insert insert action scene here but still fun. I do love it I when wrote, he screams yeah. and almost crashes. <laughs> I wrote down multiple car chase lull mm-hmm. 40 minutes in. Oh. <laughs> it's like okay. there's like there's like, okay, it's like, oh, we're getting into it. Okay, now there's like three scenes of like following, not car chasing, just yeah. like following in cars, watching in cars. This is fucking driving the movie. There's a ton of driving in this film, more than I ever recalled. That's what really stood out to me. It's like, <laughs> God damn. It's a lot of like in between scenes of people driving. Which and, in the, uh, most movies, they cut that out and you just go to <laughs> the scene. <laughs> Yes. Which is kind of like again, like this is a two and a half. My first note, what I wrote down, was exactly what I said when I started up. Two and a half hours. Fuck me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what this reminds me of is a, a great classic SNL skit, The Californians, where they the always talk about directions. There was a ton <laughs> yeah. of direction talk right off the bat. They're giving go literal on, addresses yeah, in the beginning, yeah. like yeah, <laughs> you go over there, uh, go to fourteen, blah blah blah. I'm like oh, yeah. what the fuck? God damn, what dude! I paused it. I gotta know. I paused it at forty minutes in. And probably because I was getting a little exhausted and I saw that runtime, you know, when you hit pause, you can see how much more you have to go. <laughs> sure. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, believe me, I paused it in other places too, but I, I paused it there at 40 minutes in and I'm like, well, what do we have so far here? Like guy gets murdered and the lead investigator, the investigator wants to fuck the prime suspect. Like that's, a, that's like all we have. Like, is this interesting enough? And, and he seems Nick, Curran or Curran mm-hmm. or whatever the fuck, however it's pronounced. Kern. I know. I hear Kern, it like three different ways. I, yeah. Everyone says it a different way. I noticed that too. I don't eventually look it up and see it in print and be like, okay, Curran. Um, so he, he claims at one point that like by getting close to her, that's how he's going to catch his killer. Uh, <laughs> even though he's falling <laughs> in love with her and all this stuff. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I am. And I am not a cop. But I'm pretty sure that you're fucking with due process here. I don't think <laughs> that uh, this is a legit way of collecting evidence. Not sure it's going to stand up in a court is what I'm saying. So all these uh, you right. know, things that you're telling yourself that you're doing this because you want to uh, catch the killer. Clearly, he just wants to sleep with her. And yeah, you know, that, is that the most convincing thing to watch? I don't know. I mean, like, yeah. but he is a bad guy before he meets her. Right. I mean, that's kind of like they, they do establish that. Yeah, four shootings in five years. What the fuck kind of cop is this? <laughs> two, two tourists, bro. Two. What the hell? Then when he kills Beth, he kills her for putting her hand in her pocket. Yeah, mm. and his it. wife committed suicide. It's like this guy's got this guy's got a fucked up life going yeah. on, man. Yeah, he's not Dur- no wonder Eternal Affairs is all over his ass. This guy fucking is terrible at his job. <laughs> That's kind of why. Blackjack I, shooter. I was rooting for Nelson the whole movie. <laughs> I find night. your belief system fascinating. <laughs> That's all I kept I saying for five minutes when he came I, on I screen. You, man, I, you're exactly right, Travis. It's like that. Clearly, he just wants to sleep with this woman, but that's kind of why I like the character because it's like a different kind of cop. He's got all these vices, and they slowly kind of come out after he meets Catherine. The smoking, like the drugs, yeah. like the the even like the rough sexual stuff these like inclinations these primal oh, basic man. instincts are kind of coming out of him when he meets her and it kind of makes him you know not kind of but he definitely is like simpatico with Catherine, yeah. which is interesting get, in a movie like this and esther house claims that he's based on a real guy that he knows mm. oh Easter. well let's, let's give credit to gene Triplehorn for that scene that was not an easy scene for her to do i'm sure her first a- <laughs> first film this is her first yeah movie. i mean dude you got I already gave my love for Sharon Stone, but I mean, Gene Triplehorn, what oh, up? Ooh. Beautiful. Gorgeous. I mean, this guy's stuck Animal between two of the most beautiful this. women in the world <laughs> oh in this God. crime thriller. I mean, yeah. what a go- she's a great actress. I've always <laughs> liked Triplehorn too, but I mean, what a knockout. A beautiful Fantastic. woman. Good God. Fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, Sharon Stone's never done a goddamn thing for me, but Gene Triplehorn looks incredible Dude, on this. I'm with you. I'm like, I was, 
I didn't get I didn't give a fuck about anything that was happening with Catherine the entire movie. She's like the most bland cheerleader face I've ever oh seen. Oh my in god, a major yes. movie. I'm sorry, Mike, but Jean Triplehorn, if she was the character, I would have been so much more invested. She seemed so much more rich, more complex, internalized. Yeah. But like Catherine Tram was like your red shoe diary, basic formulaic <laughs> trash villain. And also, if we're talking about it, we should mention that like the rough sex scene between Douglas and her, like <clears throat> On one hand, like they have an established relationship, so clearly she's into rough mm -hmm. sex because mm -hmm. it goes straight into that. But at yep. one point, she does say, No, stop, ow. Yeah. Yes. Ah. The director's cut yeah. even worse. There's like 10, 12 extra seconds in that scene that make it even worse. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Because they kind of so, skipped to the end in the regular I guess, one. Yeah, they want to. I guess they, they, you know, they again want us to know he's not a great guy. But, but everyone gets hung up on like the rough sex part. How about the three thrusts and then he's done? Yeah. <laughs> That's how horny he is, dude. This guy's out of control. That was this literally what happened. He like three thrusts yeah. and he falls over on her. Hey, who? <laughs> it's like, good God. Okay, you're right. He does. Also, this movie would have really been worse, in my opinion. And they would have been typical if they allowed Dr. Garner to be like he sees, oh, Dr. Garner, you've saved me. That's not what happens. I want this movie's cool for that reason because Dr. Garner trying to help Mr. Curran be a better person she goes way out of her way to help this guy through oh, yeah. so many means and i've never seen a uh, by the way this is that era where like cop movies relied super heavily on a female psychiatrist psychologist in-house <laughs> oh, like yeah. lethal weapon yep. you know like <laughs> yeah. so, but but she dies he kills her and he you know he pulls out the bart simpson Keychain, like, oh no, I'm a fucking asshole of the century. <laughs> but then, but then, like, so he, but he must accept that it was her that was the killer that killed his best friend because he must not think it's the woman he's going to go home and have children with or not. You're right. Rugrats. Yeah. Fuck like minks, raise rugrats. Right. Yeah. That's so, George Zunda's line, by the way. George Zunda, Hoss. Oh Did anyone listen to Hoss after they watched this movie? No. Okay. <laughs> I didn't Did either. I don't think so. No, I was just checking. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. But he's a great character. George, I love George because he is this guy who's trying to be the voice of reason, and it doesn't work out. It just never makes sense, and he get, even gets killed. He gets his own guy killed in the end, his own pal, who's a <laughs> shit-faced, chili-eating cowboy who loves to say hoss, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't work out. Yeah, he, he gets killed. <laughs> Yeah, she got so many. Oh By the way, <laughs> Stephen Tobolowsky, is this the most dramatic movie you've ever seen Stephen Tobolowsky in, Travis? We know you love Stephen Tobolowsky. So, no, Glimmer Man, hello. Um, oh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I loved him in this movie, though, because he's, he's got, like, eyeliner on, and he's, like, super intense with, like, his fingers, like, he's mm -hmm. talking. And, he gets up-close like, shots, super up-close shots. Right, and he was like, oh, I'm getting up-close shots? I better go extra intense. <laughs> Dude. Any 90s movie that has both Stephen Tobolowsky and James Rebhorn making, a, making an appearance, that is a classic 90s film. Whether mm -hmm. it's good or bad, mm -hmm. it's a classic 90s film just by... by Automatically all done. <laughs> <Two men. laughs> yeah, and Wayne Knight, of course, playing the assistant oh, DA. Of course. Okay, hang on. What was now the sweat budget up? on this movie? Now that Wayne Knight has come up, let's we have to we have to address since we, we've talked about this scene, we've talked about this same, you know the vagina scene over and over yeah. again, but we haven't talked about Wayne Knight, and we are calling him Wayne Knight in 1992. Did any motherfucking person watching this movie know that guy's name is anything other than Newman? Bad at best, you're right. No. At best. It was. I mean, Jurassic Park was the next year, so it wasn't even. We got dots in here. Exactly. Right. So, like, I mean, that that to me is super weird. That you're gonna take, like, this. You're gonna like have the most sexual scene, and you're gonna take the most unsexual, famous, like, super famous. 1992 Newman in 1992 from Seinfeld. I mean, <laughs> how famous was this fucking guy? The character, at least. Not maybe Wayne Knight, but the character at that point. And to plug him, of all people in that situation, I can't think of anything. Like, it doesn't <laughs> seem bizarre now, but at the time, it must have been so weird to be like, well, what the fuck is Newman doing there? <laughs> Hello, Newman. Is, uh, and, uh, yeah. Mike, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, please. I want to hear it. It would be a good time to kind of stop. And if we're still on that interrogation scene to address the... Uh, controversy uh from the um gay community on this film which was in, in very very intense oh yeah um, it, it, it i mean really quickly the accusation is thrown at it about um bisexual or um uh, uh, heterosexual people being these violent weirdos was uh, omnipresent surrounding this film 
when I take a look at it in 2023, I'm seeing a, like a, a powerful woman owning like eight other guys in this other room, like getting ex 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 exactly the type of reaction she wants out of them. Uh, I, I'm seeing powerful, like strong women here and all the Weasley little got men looking like the assholes. So, <laughs> I mean, I think that some, I mean, sexual power is power. It's refreshing to see power on film when it, and, and exercised by a woman when it's not mm -hmm. sexual. Um, I, I, I think the problem was the fact that bisexual people in particular are so underrepresented in film, even in 2023. Um, it, I mean, it's bisexual people. There are so many millions of them. And yet, like, this is one of the only fucking movies where a lead character is a bisexual. Um, it, we started getting more like secondary characters uh, in the last 10 years or so. Or like the friend, the bi friend, always a female, by the way. Um, of course. But I, I hate it when I say female, when I mean woman. I'm not talking about scorpions or Katie dids. But anyways, um, we got it. It's OK. You know what I mean? So the idea that um, I think that for a lot of people, it's just like, oh, finally representation on screen. And she's a psycho deranged manipulative killer was the problem. But I, I, I see your point, too. But I think that it was the timing more. maybe. Yeah. That was 30 years know. ago. And NC-17 was on this. There's a lot of outside controversy around this film, again, because of prudish America and then underrepresented groups feeling like they're slighted in mainstream filmmaking. It all makes sense to me. I get it. I get everybody's beefs. And I, yeah, no, I get it. And you're right, though, Eric, in the end, this film now today watching it, it seems it's not, I'm not going to say it's tame. It's still pretty uh, intense film. I'll say, you know, with sexuality and violence, which is a fucking hallmark of your guys one of your favorite genres. You know, you guys love that. It, it always mm -hmm. gets combined. Sex and violence happens yeah. all the time in, in those horror worlds. But mm -hmm. this is not a horror film. Right? This is a thriller, a murder mystery, if you will. And it's just filled with so many fun characters. I, it's actually what I like about the movie is the like, guy like uh who plays the guy from Major League who plays up your butt Joe Boo that guy who plays Captain Talcott he's up everybody's ass about everything oh. and there's a lot of close ups of face to face people like hey you better watch your ass Carnage like <laughs> and then the guy from the other guy from Seinfeld we had Newman and then we had the guy yeah. who wasn't on the air yet Absolutely. as a. Uh, Kruger, who's uh, oh, yeah. playing oh, yeah. Kruger. playing Nielsen, and he Kruger. and Coco also, the also <laughs> he's also a Super Trooper. So, I like you. I like you. Yeah, yeah. I love I love that guy. The guy yeah, I don't even know his name. I don't either. Daniel uh, Von Bargen. Oh, Daniel. Tragic yeah, Daniel Von Bargen. Yeah. Oh, he had a tragic ending. That yeah, sucks. Daniel Von Bargen. And Travis, our guy uh, Jack McGee's in this, yeah. who is oh, always yeah. playing a cop. Around. <laughs> yeah, playing a goddamn cop in 1992. Yeah, all the way back in 92, Jack McGee, always playing a cop or a fireman. There he <laughs> is. <laughs> There's a yep. parade of faces in this movie. Even the guy, uh, Mitch Pelegi. I'm like, oh, it's Mitch that Pileggi. guy. Yep. Yeah. 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 Mitch Pelegi plopping in. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, and, a lot of faces in this movie. That's a good point. And, and again, like they're also very like 90s character actors. So it's there's a lot of like, oh, that guy. It's him. It's Mitch Pelegi. It's so and so. <laughs> um, Miss Pleggy's in the scene. Isn't he part of the the interrogation scene? Mm -hmm. No, he's part of the second interrogation That's scene when Nick Karan is suddenly in the in the opposite. <laughs> but you know what I love about the interrogation scene is the fact that no man can cop, and even actually outside of that scene, like throughout the whole movie, no man can comprehend that she has sex with people she doesn't love. Wait, like you don't love him, but <laughs> you have sex with him? This is Bad a God. possibility. <laughs> a woman can, now I do this all the time, but a woman could have sex without love involved. Like it, it, it's like numerous times throughout the movie, someone makes you yeah. like repeat that, and she's all like bold and like sideways mm -hmm. eyed and like looking mm -hmm. at them. Yes, I fuck. You ever fuck on cocaine, Nick? <laughs> uh, it's such a matter of fact way she says it. It's so yes. it's like a breast cough. Yeah, maybe, probably. But the uh, also, is, like, it's the most Hollywood eyes fucking interrogation room I've ever seen oh, in my life. Oh for the god, movie. yeah, yeah, they don't look like that. Um, you better one like this is Esther House, dude. And like, uh, this guy was he got like three million off this. And like, I dude, I love Flash Dance, I love Jagged Edge. And he comes in here with this like firecracker script. And like, after this, like, he, he's like Mr. Sleaze, like, <laughs> in basic instinct, like, this, the um, the sexual kind of fencing and even some of just the erotic scenes, like. They don't seem sleazy to me, like showgirls and like Jade and that. That is fucking like oh. sleaze. But this, like, I, I, I don't see like the, 
very that classy. type of stuff in in these scenes. They they're sexy. The sex scenes are very. I mean, there's when there's murder, it's awful, mm -hmm. but yeah. the sex scenes are super classy and like rich people sex almost. It really. I mean, she's a rich woman. She's worth 110 million dollars. They say in the movie, by the way, which is a shitload of money in that day of age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd take 110 million dollars now, Chief. I would love that. Oh, of course I would. I'm just I'd saying. Take 100 dollars right now. <laughs> Can so I get awesome. $50 Venmo me? Uh, <laughs> Can I find a dime on the street? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I, Eric, I do agree with you. I don't, to me, this movie's not sleazy at all. But then again, I also don't look at sex as sleazy. It can't, like, uh, I guess sleazy would be defined. Mickey Rourke and uh, uh, eight and a, nine and a half weeks. That's sleaze. That's, yeah. yeah I think that, that is more like they're fucking in a fucking stairwell in a New York City shithole. Yeah. Okay. That's sleaze. Yeah. When like they're in the club in the basic in basic instinct <laughs> and and Roxy and um and Catherine see uh Nick and like she kisses Roxy and just like grabs her titty. It's like that's the kind of thing it's like this is like this is not how people behave in real life ordinarily. And you know, maybe I've not spent a lot of time in clubs. I'm sure you haven't been, been in that club, bro. I haven't been in that club in nineteen ninety two, that's for sure. Yeah, but, it's California too, man. But, but, I mean Who there's I, I think that the you know I don't think I'm a puritanical person, but I do think that there's parts in this movie where sex is presented somewhat sleazily. I would, yeah, I would, I would yeah. Agree. Uh, she was also trying to get a reaction out of Nick, sure. Like, and that's like another thing is like, it's easy for an audience in 1992 to just look at a different type of sex scene in a movie and immediately just call it sleazy. I think yeah. it was kind of refreshing, edgy at the time too have scenes like this, not just to ape on like French or Italian cinema, but to kind of expose audiences to different ways of portraying that in a film. Yeah, but at the same time, I'll never unsee Michael Douglas giving head. <laughs> oh, why? He does a great job of it. I mean, like, like him, like now I know what his the top half of his face yep. looks like when yep. he's doing that. that. <laughs> I don't want to know oh! that. Travis, I, I laugh in that scene when he's yeah, like, ah, ah. he's like <laughs> lapping at her breast when she's trying to tie him up. He's like, ah, ah, ah. it made me laugh. Oh, I man. laughed so much when I see <laughs> I took the movie seriously, but I still laughed because he's laughing like a dog or like a, a fiend. Yeah, yeah. It's it's he kind really of funny, is. but you're right. As she puts him yeah. through the murder scene that he's fully aware of, like, yeah, and, and, you... and, and the viewer is supposed to be like, well, maybe she's not the killer. I don't know. Uh, did she it, ever though, throw man. her back on this movie? How many times does she have to do a scene where she's like, ah! like we saw there was like four different sex times four individual separate scenes alone who knows how many takes were done oh, yeah. where she actually only ice picked somebody once though in the end right you're right and it's like a full double backward and half yeah, thing that Jesus. she does every time ah! like, there's there some flexibility there i gotta give her credit for that um yeah. okay what why is michael douglas the main character like is he supposed to be hot like why? Why don't they go? Like, is it because no one else would do these scenes? Like, why don't we have like Mickey Rourke or like Richard Gere or like anybody that's under the age of forty-seven well, as he, this main he character? He signed on. It took what fourteen yeah. different people or thirteen people to find Sharon Stone because they all turned it down. But he signed on early, and, and he was one of yes. the reasons why I was getting funded. So he yes. must have liked the script and must have just been like, "I want to play," you know. It, it was a couple years away from Hard Rain. He hadn't done anything quite like this yet. <laughs> Black, Black Rain. Black Rain. Black Rain. Black Rain. Sorry. Hard Rain was a uh, Christian Slater. Um, yeah. Different film. Like, but, it, are, are female audiences turned down by Michael Douglas when they would have been by like if this was like Matt Dillon or Richard Gere? Is this movie made for female audiences? Uh, he married Catherine Zeta Jones. I don't know. She's a beautiful woman. So clearly women find him adoring. And he's also the son of Kirk Douglas, who was a famous actor. I think it bakes into it a bit. It does. He's not the sexiest guy of all time, no doubt about it. Yeah. But he also had behind the face what they needed. They needed a guy who could who sex appeal. He's maybe that wasn't his strength in this role, but everything else he does as the character is needed. And, and Michael Douglas brings it all to the table in terms of the the pain and the frustration and intensity. It, I mean, yeah, the absolute intensity. I mean, this guy Michael Douglas is so intense this whole movie. He's never chill. He's on edge all the fucking yeah. time. Right. <laughs> because he quit smoking and quit drinking recently. So exactly. And he's dying up. for doing some coke so he can fuck on cocaine, Nick. <laughs> right. That's what, you know, he's dying for it. Also, yeah. there's a great, I had to mention this. I know we got to go soon. Eric, you got to go. You got to hard out. We got to start no, to wrap good, this up. Good. 
Okay, but uh, there's a terrible ADR when Beth comes into his apartment to confront him, and he's drunk and pissed, and she attacks him because he's saying some really fucking harsh shit because he's fucking off his rocker. Mm -hmm. And she comes at him, and you hear ADR, are you nuts? It just made me laugh so much. You gotta go back and listen. Just check out the scene. You you're gonna laugh. Yeah, you're, you're gonna hear the "Are you nuts?" with that high end of his voice yep, in yep. ADR. I've it's hilarious. It. Yeah, it's very back. funny. Uh, you know, I, I'll give him credit for like clearly wanting to take a risk in his career. This is a guy who started out as a producer and then kind of made his way into Cuckoo's I mean, Nest this, too. Yeah, yeah, Cuckoo's Nest. Um, and and a lot of you know he he had. But also, Fatal Attraction had kind of made him mm -hmm. a big star. Mm -hmm. right. and, Wall Street, you want to get Gordon Gecko, dude? I mean, there well, you go. yeah, that too. Yeah. You're right. But but so this was kind of a return to form of of Fatal Attraction. But like, mm -hmm. how can I? Well, I've never seen that movie actually. But I'm assuming he's <gasps> upping the ante here. I know it's weird. I've never seen that movie. And I actually Fatal Attraction. Like, yeah, I've never seen it. And I made a Boil Your Bunny oh. Rabbit. Um, reference you did. I remember that. Our age, and they did not get it. Um, oh, but, somebody brought it up on the show recently. I remember saying that. But you've never seen Adrian Lyons. Fatal attraction. I, do, yeah, I don't like his movies very much. Um, <laughs> that's when we did Jacob's Ladder, which I did like. You might not um, be missing much. I'm just going to say that now. Yeah, I think I think I know the plot of Fatal Attraction by this point. <laughs> no, you I did. You cannot comprehend it till you <laughs> see it on film. Well, oh, yeah, any final notes, guys? Any final commentaries? Any? Uh, oh, uh, Mrs. Doubtfire Road. Anybody notice that the Mrs. <laughs> Doubtfire Road? <laughs> What? San Francisco, the movie. <laughs> this is so San Francisco. It was actually called Mrs. Doubtfire Road. Oh, wait, it, looked, it looked just like that street oh, that they like live it. on in that movie. That house. It's San Francisco. San Francisco. That same goddamn road. I swear it's been in like 10 San Francisco movies. It's like the hill going down so you can see into downtown and then you can go out to the water. I'm telling you, it's been a lot of film. Uh, we don't really talk about that Roxy character. I kind of I, I like the way they wrote the character i think it would have been easy to just have her be like jealous girlfriend that's bisexual and isn't it like sexy but like she's dependent on Catherine because of her drug issues and i think that comes across more so than her just being jealous and like a threat and i like what those scenes with her and michael douglas when like he knows exactly that he's like milking her for her money and all that and he doesn't give a fuck when he's like walking around dude in the moonlight and all that shit like getting in her man face. to man <laughs> like <the inner> <laughs> yeah like i mean she also dies in a horrific car wreck with a flawless face that's unusual i would say i'm just <laughs> minor detail yeah. don't want to really I, complain I about flawless. it how did she die then this this like um entourage of people that Catherine Trammell keeps around her that also just happen to be murderers. Yes. Like, oh, uh, she, but she's not a murderer. It's all research. It's all research, Shooter. Um, oh! That, Travis, you just reminded me that I had a massive Zodiac feeling to this movie they're all like they're all over the, these counties he's going to different police stations across california it yeah. started to feel like the movie zodiac not the actual case yeah. but the movie to me i got a lot of zodiac vibes oh. from this i i just want i'm not saying that they ripped anything off it just felt like that a lot okay well, serial killer please i mean he yeah, but like just the fact that they're going to different little because they go yeah, to like three different yeah. tinier police stations around california I'm oh telling my you, it God. makes sense we're so dumb we didn't hmm. we didn't acknowledge uh the the clear fact that there's no DNA evidence even discussed in this case at all. <laughs> like I was doing a, the little reading I did is Joe Westerhouse being like, Look, I didn't mention it. I know I didn't mention it. It was clearly like the number one thing to to look at in nineteen ninety two, like since yeah. like the mid eighties, and like this would have solved it immediately because yeah. it was <laughs> like that, that dude says all over the bed, like there's not one word about that being collected, which would have just solved it right then and there, or at least exoner exonerated her. I think there's a I lot really of things in this movie that if you uh, take a moment and remove your suspension of disbelief, you'll be like, this is not real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, if we want to jump into it, 
No, wait, 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 wait. Hang on. I got. What about ice picks? I mean, I've never used an ice pick, and I'm 42 years old. I never saw anyone use an ice pick. Yeah. We've always had ice cube trays. Yeah. Is this really where, like where everybody? Are they these blocks of ice to even I use the ice pick on. Is that a thing in California? We live in Michigan, so in we have 19- more access to water. We can freeze in cubes. In the 1930s, I don't get it. in the 1930s, it was a thing. Yes. <laughs> Before, okay. There you. You know, like, but like people that were makes not sense. like. Yeah, and and so when she, when she when he shows up at her house and she's using an ice pick, and he's supposed to not be like we're supposed to as the audience be like, well, she still may or may not be the killer. Maybe she just has an ice. Like no one uses a fucking ice pick. Dude, you guys aren't you guys don't have ice trucks that deliver like blocks of ice on those like little hooks to you for your fridge? No, I no, guess no. not. Yeah. No. Right. Yeah. It makes sense that since Esther House is writing a 40s noir here that he's just you know, he's <laughs> foregoing DNA. He's using right. ice blocks. OK, it makes sense now. To In the some era, ways, so. this movie would have been really interesting if he'd said it a little further. I mean, it's mm-hmm. still pretty interesting, but he, he mm-hmm. could have said it further in the past and it would have That's, still worked. Yeah. Great point. Um, cause we could, yeah. We, yeah, we could have looked through all of these tiny little things we have. Um, yeah, I, I love that point. I think it like that era can't be that sexual, that. Eric. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like that would have actually been refreshing. Like, oh, it's yeah. the forties and we're, we're naked still as doing fuck. this sort of stuff. Yeah. Right. It would have yeah. been really, that would have been cool actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh mm. shit. All right. Well, uh, well, okay. Yeah. Time to find out. It's the judgment day. Does it hold up or not? Eric Branch, have you picked a film? So why don't you lead us off? I'd never seen it, man. All, and like I said, growing up, I knew about the one particular scene and the cover box. And I always just thought of this as like a sleazy joke. And the Joe Hester house was this like scumbag hack writer that specialized in sleaze. Uh, <laughs> and I watched the movie and yeah, it had its laws and I wasn't exactly pausing it on bathroom breaks, but I, I was digging. I was entertained by it. Like, um, uh, like I definitely love like the pulpy nature of things and like the rich cinematography with the Jerry Goldsmith score kind of covering everything. It worked for me, man. It, it reminded me of those classic uh, noirs that the type that you really don't have to care about the plot or even like who is guilty or who is innocent, which I didn't during this at all. But uh, the journey is still a lot of fun and the interplay between the characters, like the, the firecracker dialogue is here. Uh, so, yeah, I enjoyed the movie. I mean, it's it's dumb, but entertaining. <laughs> and I'll take dumb and entertaining over boring and poorly written any any day of the week. I think it holds up, man. I kind of liked it. Yay! Okay. I'll go next. It's a movie that I've seen many, many times. I post my teenage years watching it as a film. I've watched it a lot. I really have. I'll throw it on. Yeah. And I guess I'm entertained. <laughs> yeah, I'm entertained, man. It's a sexual thriller. That's right. It's a stupid movie, too. It's really, really funny, though, in the ways that maybe it's not supposed to be funny. So that in and of itself, for me, is probably going to be all right. It's entertaining. I laugh. Uh, there's gorgeous women that I'm very attracted to. I've that's a good thing. I'm not going to deny that at all. I'm a human being. I have feelings. I have emotions. I have desires. I admit that. I love Leanne. Leanne, I love you. Don't worry. Everything's fine. But, you know, in the end, I look at this film and I say, it's got a lot of faces that I know. I'm like, oh, look at all my buddies. Oh, I know all these people. And it holds up. It's it's stupid. It's stupid in a lot of ways. And it's cheesy. <laughs> yeah. But as an entertainment piece for me, it holds up. All right, I, th- I think you made a good point, Eric, about maybe not caring so much about who's guilty or not, because one of my big complaints <laughs> about the movie has been that it's pl- pretty obvious that she is the killer, and it's supposed to. And then the, that big reveal at the end that she actually had the ice pick is supposed to throw us for a loop uh, when it doesn't. So that's I think that's a good point. Um, you guys both use the adjective stupid, I guess, in a positive way. I'm going to use it in a <laughs> yes, negative way. I think the movie was stupid. I was grateful when it was over. I thought it was really, really long. Um, I think that there is there are moments of uh, really, really beautiful shots and really, really solid direction. I think there are moments of truly um, inspired dialogue. I think some of the back and forth that they have are just like classic movie kind of dialogue, like that scene on the beach in particular, in, in particular between the two of them, uh, really, really solid. There are many great moments in this movie, and I can 100% see why in 92 this was such a huge hit. But watching it now, I can't, I would not, I would not say to someone, hey, have you seen Basic Instinct lately? You have no idea what you're missing. No, you're not missing fucking anything. The movie does not hold up. 
<laughs> Mike, oh. did you watch that clip I sent you of Bill Hicks summing up this movie in like oh. a minute? What? I, I didn't get a chance it. to. I'm, I'm going to see. I want to see that for sure. Oh, send yeah. it to me. I yeah, love Bill Hicks. <laughs> oh, wow. What's okay. Well, that's, hey, that's folks. One. I don't know if it went the way you thought it would go, but that's the bottom line here. Basic Instinct, Cinema and I podcast, Cinema and I pod at gmail.com. Send us an email, five star review. YouTube, like, sub, be our friends, socialize with us on social medias. Uh, all right. Next week. My turn. Yes. I have to say something now, right? You have yes, to pick a Michael. movie. What you're going to pick in this moment? Uh, the, what the yes. did you think moment. <laughs> I would do in this moment? Ooh, like that song. All right, guys. I have my list. It's ready to rock. There's so many options. So Excited. many options. But mm-hmm. I'm going to take this thing in a... <laughs> I'm going to take this thing down a notch, man. And it's going to be Lower than waiting? interesting. It's going to be depressing. I don't know. Awesome. It's probably going to be less funny. I expect a ton less humor for this one. No laughs. No jokes. Probably. Maybe not. Uh, we're going to 2016. And we're doing Manchester by the Sea. <laughs> oh, shit. oh, God, dude. <laughs> Grab the Zoloft. Oh. <laughs> I told you. Oh, I wasn't man. kidding. Yeah, the Giggle Woo. Fest. Yeah, yeah Giggle it's Fest is over. over. Yeah, that's right. Get them out now. <laughs> Sober up. It's not funny. Wow. Yeah, no, it's been uh, uh, a little over six years. Yeah. 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 I'm curious if this is a good movie or not. I, I'm not sure. I'm really not. And I haven't seen it since I saw it in the theater. Same. So. Yeah. Not since it was new, anyway. Yeah, right. All right. It works for me. Great. Hey, then we'll, we'll be okay. doing that next week. Anything uh, coming up on Thursday? We'll be here on Thursday at 7 p.m. Yeah. Eastern We're, time. We expect to be here at 7 we'll 15 ish. Seven. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. I'll be here. You be here? I'll be here. I'll be here. Yeah, I'll well, you here. feel better, buddy. Take care of yourself. Thank Eric you. Branchum, go enjoy your family. Happy birthday to our little buddy over there. Everybody, mm-hmm. enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for watching us, Cinema Night Pod. We'll see you. Jack.